vehicle tried to block us in, four guys jumped out with AKs and shotguns, and then that vehicle chased us out of town. Uh, so it's all about smarts, um, brains over brawn, going in with weapons. If we was to go in with a weapon, um, that can cause so many more complications than what it would be not. and I stood in front of the Lebanese Mafia in my underwear. But the question kept coming around, who else is going to do it if I don't do it? Jay, how are you, brother? Yeah, living the dream. Thanks for having me on here. Oh, you're very welcome. You're looking really well. Oh, cheers, man. Same to you. Yes. So we need to thank Chris, isn't it? Your 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 um, cousin Chris for putting us in touch. Yeah, that's right. And he said, "You need to meet my cousin Chris. He's an amazing man, uh, former soldier. Can I call it turned child rescuer? Is that?" Yeah, I mean uh, the terms would probably be around child recovery specialist, something along there. I don't think there's anything set in stone with it. That sounds a bit more professional, doesn't it? Yeah. So how did it how did it all begin? What what what's your military background? Yeah, so um, nine years old, knew I wanted to join the army. Sixteen years old, I joined the army. Went into the light infantry, second battalion. Um, six years in the army, served in Northern Ireland, Kosovo, Iraq, um, and Sierra Leone operationally. And then outside of that, I was in Falklands, uh, Jordan, Gibraltar, Cyprus. So uh, so I got around in the short period of time that I was in, but. I don't think my career actually started until I got out of the army and started contracting. Um, contracting is a completely different ball game. Uh, did you see? So, can you just tell us a bit about you've been in some hot spots? Then, did, did you see much uh, action in the army? Not so much. Most of it was um, policing, more than anything. Um, obviously, standard operational tours. You're going in, you're doing patrols, making sure that everything's okay in the areas. Sometimes you go into search buildings and stuff like that. There's a little bit out in Iraq, um, a few pop shots here, there, and some operations, but that was about it. Um, so I didn't really get to do what I wanted to do when I was in the army. But when I got out, <laughs> um, I ended up in a situation where I was on the streets uh, for about six months after I got out. Um, and then I ended up randomly just falling into contracting. And I got on a plane, I went to Baghdad because um, I was invited over by a company. And just on that first day, I knew for a fact I was about to start doing the job that I wanted to do out there. It was just crazy. Is that sort of protection work, do you call it? Yeah, close protection work primarily. Um, we had some big contracts out there with um, Gulf Regional Division, um, the Corps of Engineers for the US Army, looking after their high rankers, um, looking after um, civilians, civilian entities that are actually doing small projects out there, and basically just taking them from A to B, and then, uh, and then back. But it was during the really rough times, especially down in Baghdad, when Route Iris was classed as the most dangerous road in the world. Um, I've put some stories up on TikTok about it where I tell a few stories about it, of what happened, because I learned how to drive on that road and I learned how to change a tire on that road under fire. Um, so it was, it, was definitely a, it was definitely a very interesting way to go through the basics of life of learning to drive. But um, it, it served its purpose because... I ended up contracting for about 17 years um, between Iraq, Afghanistan, West Africa, I even did a bit of maritime um, on the merchant ships and then on the Prince of Abu Dhabi's yacht. Now, all of those experiences put together um, and the way that it all worked out, when I started to fall into the child recovery, and it's again, it's another thing that I fell into, um, that started to become uh, at the forefront of everything. Those experiences took it to a, to, to a completely new level of what existed in the industry at the time. Jay, can I just say, chuck the pen away, mate? Because oh, <laughs> one of my worst, worst habits when I'm ever, like giving a lecture or anything. <laughs> I'm the same. I sometimes pick up a toothpick and then I think, oh my god, I'm 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 live to the world holding a toothpick. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, yeah, no. Audio is every the audio in this in podcast is more important, obviously, than the um than the video because we can always put pictures up or whatever but yeah when it's when it's doing that in someone's earphones they're like nope yeah i, I paid a thousand pounds for my phone and my earphones i don't want to <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
to this. Um, yes, so one of my best mates, um, he bought it in Mosul back in the day. One of the uh, in the early stages of the um, the security or the private security over there, he got uh, execute. Well, they had a contact. They were leading their client to, I think it was like a, a gas refinery or something. And um, it was him and another bootneck in the, in the let's say, the lead Land Rover. And I think there were two, two in the rear and um, the, the client's vehicle was in the middle. And they got ambushed by, gosh, I've, I've heard different stories, it's something like 15 to 30 pickup trucks um, and uh, the two Marines, they just pulled off and started laying down cover and fire for their client and they both both um, got slotted. So it's a weird thing to turn the TV on and there's your mate's dead body lying in the middle of Mosul with a big crowd around it and apparently what, what happened next... Um, I won't say on camera, but I'm sure yeah. people can imagine. Um, there was a lot of lot of bitterness over there, wasn't there? Yeah, it was terrible. Um, I mean, I went in when the uh, Blackwater guys got taken down in um, Fallujah, um, and I started the Fallujah War and everything. So it's, it, it was rough. I mean, those days were definitely rough. And did uh, you did, did you get any hairy situations yourself? Uh, I mean, multiple. <laughs> Um, again, I've told a few stories out on TikTok, but um, I mean, there's been times where we've been nearly taken um, out of our vehicles by the Iraqi police. Um, we have multiple ID contacts, multiple um, small arms fire contacts. Um, like I said, I learned how to change a tire on the fire, which was it was one of the most surreal experiences that anyone could ever have because I was 22, just about to turn 23 at the time, and I had some big, burly South African bloke who's in his mid-30s to mid-40s handing me a wheel brace and telling me to get down behind and change the tire and I hadn't got a clue how to do it. Um, and I'm there going, mm, I was infantry, I can shoot, let me just stand here and I'll give cover and fire. But he had no interest in that. And the way that he taught me, it was like being in a classroom. That's how calm he was. And then obviously there's me um, <laughs> wondering what's going on around me as I'm trying to break, crack the, crack the wheel nuts on this wheel to get this wheel off. It was uh, it was surreal. But I mean... Yeah, um so you didn't get approached by an F1 team then to be on the crew? <laughs> definitely not. But seriously, we could definitely pass for it. <laughs> well, it's the fastest way to learn, I'm telling you. It's a different world, isn't it? Because we sort of have these conversations. And and I've had civvy mates say to me before, Chris, that story you told about being in the Marines, like you're bullshitting, right? <laughs> And I get it. I completely get it. But what I don't say to him is like, if you think that's yeah, that story's hot. You, you I've got another like thirty stories of, of a combination of drunkenness, stupidity, guns going bang, bombs going bang, mortars going bang, fire bombs, um, you know, petrol bombs <laughs> fly, flying <laughs> in, as well as some. Um, tragic things. Lots of Marines just seem to die in, in car accidents and motorbike accidents. And yeah, and we had that as well. Yeah, we had two, uh, two lads um, killed surfing on a train in Thailand, and it went went through a tunnel. Um, a mate I was on rear party with at Four Two Commando right, right when I first joined my unit. Um, was running away from the police on leave. I guess it was drunk and been a fight or something. And um, he jumped off a rooftop and landed on a, a like a fencing pole or something. And yeah. yes, it's uh, it's sort of a different world, isn't it? And um, I think when I podcast a lot of military people, we tend to be quite humble about our experiences because in the military that they, they, you know they're all kind of on a par with everyone else's but yeah. to our civilian um brothers and sisters they're probably i'm, I'm sure for a good man <laughs> it's a it's a bloody eye opener oh definitely i mean uh, the amount of times that i've spoken to people that are just based in the civilian world never been in the military and especially when i was living out in cyprus 
Um, close friends of mine, they just couldn't believe it. They always said it sounded like a movie. Um, and that's why I started going down that route. But we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, yes, Child Rescue, it, so- it sounds incredibly admirable. Well, it is incredibly admirable. I've got quite a lot to ask you about it because there's a, there's a big wave sort of on the internet um, at the moment all about child freedom and this kind of stuff. The trouble is it's hard to know where the reality stops and the kind of fantasy kicks in. But back to to your story, Jay, how how did it start? Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of conspiracies out there. Um, just touching on what you just said, there's a lot of conspiracies out there about what is happening and um, on, on the different levels that it's happening. Um, obviously, we used to dealing with facts anyway, so uh, it's usually starting from the smaller scale and then it goes up into a bigger scale. And it's probably as high as it goes does go into organised crime. But outside of that, um, it started when I was out in Afghanistan. Um, I was uh, it was at the end of 2012. I knew a guy. And I still can't remember how I met him. I'm pretty sure it was through the old MSN Messenger. Um, we used to chat quite a lot. He knew that I had quite a vast network from contracting for so long anyway. And um, every time that he was on a case, he'd always get in touch with me and ask me if I had a point of contact in the country that he was working in. Usually I did. So then I'd get somebody in touch with him and then he would be able to use that to actually help him to solve that case. So, um, yeah, he'd take a point of contact. Um did get the case done. I'd never hear anything about him until he actually came around the next time that he was on the case and asked for another point of contact. Uh, it just so happened at the end of 2012, I got a hearing injury. I lost my hearing, my eardrum uh, basically retracted back inside. Um, and it was a hearing injury that I had for about six months. So the company I was working for sent me home on sick leave, uh, which I didn't have a problem with, paid leave at home. That's fantastic, um, which was a rare occasion back then. So... Uh, he was working on a case in Lebanon and asked me to go out to Lebanon to give him fresh eyes on. Naturally, I said yes, because I'm sitting around at home, literally doing nothing but going to the bars and then it's Cyprus lifestyle, you know? So, uh, so I went over, I spent about seven days over there and, and within the first 48 hour period, um, we was in a, a Hezbollah controlled town and we got chased out of town. We, a vehicle tried to block us in. Four guys jumped out with AKs and shotguns. And then that vehicle chased us out of town within the first 48 hours. So I knew straight away that this was probably something that I could probably get into due to the fact of my background in contracting already. Um, that continued for about another five days after that period. I gave him my opinion. Um, and then I just I went home expecting him to work out a plan based on my opinion. That was it. I thought it wasn't going to go any further than that. Um, but within about another two weeks, he quit the case. And then his boss came up to me and asked me if I wanted to take on the case. So I sat down with the missus and we discussed it in, in lengthy detail. And, and the only conclusion that would always come up was who else is actually going to do this if I don't do it? I didn't know nothing about the child recovery industry or anything. I was always, I was still sitting there focused on going back to Afghanistan once I'd actually got my hearing back and I qualified through for the medical process. Um, but the question kept coming around, who else is going to do it if I don't do it? So I did it. And then I, I started working for that company and went over there. Can you give us some idea of the particular case? What, what how does it, what, what's your kind of yeah. brief? So basically, um, it was a Lebanese Australian father kidnapped his child under the guise of going on holiday to Lebanon to see his family. When they got there, they said they're not coming back. Um, the connections that were there between him and Hezbollah were from the town that he grew up in. Everybody that he knew um, were connected to Hezbollah, and the, and the, the muller of the town gave the protection over him and what he was doing, holding that child in to make sure that nobody could go in and get them out. The mother, she then went over, tried to go through the courts, failed in the courts, called in a private entity, which is a private company, and they went in to assist. Um, and even before I got there, the guy that I'd given had already fast-forwarded six months' worth of court cases into two weeks. So they started to succeed in the courts. But at the same time as that, when she went over there, she ended up being held against her will 
in this town, and then obviously under Sharia law, unable to be able to move anywhere uh, without a male presence with her. And can you explain Hezbollah for our, for our friends at home who might not be familiar with who they are? Yeah, for sure. So Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that's based out of, out of the Lebanon. Um, they also, it's a very complicated situation that's in Lebanon. I talk about that quite a bit in my book. Um, but basically, they're, they're also a part of the government. Um, pretty much what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment with the Taliban um, having elements inside the government as well. Um, but they cause a lot of problems because there's a massive divide between the Muslims and the Christians that are over there. And they also support um, Palestine. Yes. So they're kind of not people that you really want to get caught messing with. Definitely not. They they would definitely be on par with ISIS or Al Qaeda. And so they gave this father a kind of bit of a shield around him, did they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, going into that town, I tried every angle to try to get into that town before we got into the position where this vehicle was blo trying to block us into this road. Um, quite a funny story on how that happened, um, but. Um, that goes into the levels of professionalism that was in the industry. Every angle going into that into that time was covered by armed personnel. It was didn't matter which which direction that you came in. Wow. Yeah. And what? Um, I'm guessing you weren't armed. No, definitely not. Um, I mean, I don't think that they'd ever used weapons in the child recovery industry at that point until uh, until that point. Anyway, um, I've heard many stories prior. To uh, to me going into it, um, and I'm talking like two weeks prior to me going in it, um, of, of guys going into dangerous situations and not using weapons. But that's when it, the entire operation, it all becomes about using your smarts, blending in. You have to blend into the background. Um, you have to be able to, to go in and use that training. You, what we've experienced throughout the entire history of being in the military and the contracting industry and working in small teams to know how to read people and then give them what they need so you can get what you want back. Uh, so it's all about smarts, um, brains over brawn, going in with weapons. If we was to go in with a weapon, um, that can cause so many more complications than what it would be not. So it was definitely harrowing. Um, I did end up having a can of CS gas, which was quite humorous in the aspect of all of the operations that I've done before in the private security industry and the military. And then there's me standing in a hostile situation with a can of CS gas. So that was quite funny. Were you wearing the local dress? No, I, I didn't need to um, in, in the majority of that operation. Um, I probably, looking back a bit, you got to understand that this was my first operation in child recovery. So I didn't really know how it all would go down. I didn't know what I was doing. I was working it out as I was going through it. But that's where my experience came into it because it was no different to planning a military operation. Um, going back and looking back at it, I probably would have, especially when I was down in places like Tripoli and in the, and then in these in these um, highly populated uh, Muslim areas um, outside of the Christian areas, because that's obviously very Western over there. I probably would have. And so, did you get your chance to extract the the child? It was difficult and it was definitely difficult in planning. Um, we had to find a way to get them out of that town um, without us going into that town and getting them out. We managed to use the courts. It was a very difficult process, but they ended up in a town closer towards the Christian areas, which was catered more toward Western Star, and they was in, ended up in a hotel. Um, it's, it's a very long story that goes through... I was being chased. I ran. I ran cars off the roads. I got strip searched, and I stood in front of the Lebanese mafia in my underwear, telling them that I need them to deliver a package for me. Um, I ended up in Cyprus, speaking to the Cypriot mafia, um, and that was just week after week of trying to build up that trust with their relationship. And then they ended up assisting me. We ended up purchasing a boat, um, which we had to rig up completely, and. If you can imagine a scene out of MacGyver or the A-Team, that's literally what you're looking at because we had such a tight budget to be able to do it. Um, and we had to put everything on there. And then we had to send this boat across waters for 119 nautical miles. Um, one thing we didn't take into consideration was a steel frame on a fiberglass uh, base. That caused a lot of problems going over the open ocean. Um, and then 
obviously the actual day of the operation a lot of things went wrong on that day which delayed us by about 24 hours so i was literally locked down on the run for 24 hours with hezbollah and local police looking for me so it was, it was quite harrowing and that was definitely probably the longest night of my life had you got the child by this point or or yeah um it, we was delayed on the actual pickup of the child by about six hours. Uh, we managed to pick up the mother and the child without anybody knowing. Um, nobody knew for about 10 to 15 minutes, so that was our escape window. But because of the delay, we had lost our boat for that day because there's, there's a lot of complications with it. I mean, we can go through the details, but all of the details are in the book. I'll give you the basic details because, obviously, I want everybody to buy the book. <laughs> Angel, Angel in the Shadows. Angel in the Shadows, it's called. That's right. Um, so the delay was um, in the actual um, area of operation on the actual H hour was delayed by about five hours. Our boat, when I sent a boat over to Lebanon, what I wanted them to do, there was no connection between me and the guy. And I actually got an ex boot neck, um, an ex marine guy, um, as a coxman to take the boat over there. We didn't have any communications apart from one meeting where I gave him GPS coordinates, proper old school methods of leaving a piece of paper down him picking that piece of paper up. There was no connection between us whatsoever apart from drop phones. So his his entire operation was to actually check out the sea. Um, we needed to know what boats were out there, where the Coast Guards were, if there was any patrols. We needed to get the radar operator to the point where he was looking at the radar and then he was just looking going, oh my God, it's him again. And getting so tired of actually telling him what to do that um, he just gave up on looking at him. So we kept moving down that road. Um, he did that, checked out the extraction points and everything. Now, when he was breaking the rules, he got himself put under a curfew. So at night, uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon, he was he was done. He had to go back and he was put under curfew until next morning at seven o'clock in the morning. That caused our second problem after the, the delay when we did the pickup of the child. So uh, then we had to figure out on the cuff, literally on the spot thinking, we need a safe house here and now. And that's when I had to take my fixer's safe house and I kicked his family out of his house, basically. Very politely, of course. And uh, and we locked ourselves down inside his house with no no exit strategy whatsoever, apart from my can of CS gas. That was literally it. Yes. I was say, you can't really keep that for yourself, can you? You don't really no. want to gas yourself with CS gas. <laughs> no, it's crazy, it was. It's going to make you cry your eyes out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And was it a problem with the child's passport or did they have that? No. So um, the father had the passport, but we extracted out of the country through non-official methods. So we basically had a point on the coast where we actually jumped onto the boat and then we headed out to sea. Using the Cypriot Mafia, um, they met us halfway across the, uh, across the Mediterranean on the Cypriot side of international waters. Um, and then basically they pulled the boat in the coxswain then took the boat as we gained, uh, as we got into international waters. He took the boat back into the marina, says that he hit rough seas. And then we came into Larnaca Marina and we stayed below deck. Within five minutes, we walked off straight into my car and then we drove off. So it went very smoothly from that point, which was very, it's still very nervous because you're just waiting for someone to step on that boat. Like uh, So the Cypriot Mafia, they've got a, a child minding section of they. It certainly seems that way. They've definitely, they've definitely, the thing is with the Cypriots themselves, no matter who you are, your culture will always stand out. And obviously they've got a very family orientated culture. Once they got to learn, learn who I was and, and that they could trust me in, in the elements of what I was doing, then uh, they, they, they was all over it. I'm telling you, massive, massively helpful. And they didn't take money for it. They only took the money for the fuel for the boat and, um, uh, and, uh, and their expenses. They never made any profit out of it whatsoever. So it's really good of them, which is strange to say, because this is where the child recovery industry itself, it takes you down so many different roads and you deal with so many different elements uh, 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 and, and so many different types of people. But the people that are supposed to be the bad people, you end up in a situation where they're actually helping you to do something very good. It's it's strange. It's a strange world. Hey, it's nice to know the mafia's still got a good heart, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Lebanese Mafia, that was a completely different story, that was. I mean, I had two guys standing either side of me, and I'm standing in front of this, literally, it's like, 
what you would probably see on a movie. Um, imagine what you would see on a movie, and that's what I'm standing in front of. Um, and he was like, obviously trying to push out his power and all that. And there's me, Brecken pointing. <laughs> I need you to do this for me. <laughs> How much is it going to cost? And the prices were horrendous. I tell you, there was nowhere near what we could afford. Yes, I'm getting flashbacks now to getting mugged or mug stroke kidnapped in Istanbul. Yeah, uh, which was uh, yeah, that was a, that was interesting. Um, so. Were there any repercussions of this, Jay? Did did once you? I mean, where, where was the child's family based? Was it UK? Yes, no. So um, the family there, it's a Norwegian family, but um, mother and the father were they met in Australia. They lived in Australia together. Um, from after that extraction, the mother went straight back to Norway. So leaving Cyprus, she went over to Norway, and that's where she's originally from. So she stayed with her family in Norway. Um, because it's classed, no matter, no matter how harrowing and, and how hard the actual operation is and the fact that we're going up against terrorist organisations doing that, it's still classed as just a normal parental abduction. Um, now, one mistake that a lot of people make is that parental abductions are classed as safe abductions. Even the authorities in the UK, they class them as safe abductions. But a parental abduction, can you never know the mental state um, or the psychological state of the person that's actually kidnapping. And they have gone to the extremes where a parent will actually cause harm to the child or even kill the child and themselves just to get a mental play, like a power play, over the parent that they've left behind. So you've got those problems there straight away. Because they classed it as a parent of abduction, they went through the courts, um, and then going through the courts, they made sure in Norway that the child was actually safe in Norway and that the father couldn't come back to Norway with any repercussions. Repercussions for me... Um, there was some high possibilities. Um, there were mistakes that I made in my identity um, being inside the actual operation because obviously there was we, we stayed in the operation inside a hotel and I had to get into that hotel, which means I had to give them copies of my passport. Luckily for me, the passport wasn't very clear in any way whatsoever. But when I came back from Lebanon, I was in Cyprus and I'd be driving down the road. Paranoia kicked in to the highest levels I've never had in my entire life. I would be driving down the road and I'd think I'd be being followed, so I'd start counting surveillance um, and anti-surveillance. I would be walking back from a bar at night time and I'd be looking at places I'd do surveillance on my own house. I'd see people that looked like um, Lebanese um, citizens in my local bar that I didn't recognise, and then I'd be confronting them um, to find out who they were. So there was a lot of a lot of things that went on with me after that case, um, especially on the mental health side. But um, which word? Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's no repercussions as of as of yet, and it's been a long time, so I don't think there will be. And how did this lead on to, to forming Pegasus or Pegasus Ops? Yeah. So working in the child recovery industry, so I started working for this company in itself. Um, it's a company that was based out of Norway. Um, at first I thought, yeah, fantastic. I was going case after case after case and I was having successes. Um, whilst I was in Lebanon, I saw how low the standards were of the operators that they was actually using. And there wasn't many of them because these are individuals that own companies that sell themselves as larger entities, but they're not. They usually got one or two operators tops. So I was getting success after success. But then I got to a case where it was a parent abduction again. And be under no illusion that Parental abductions are, are not just the things that I deal with. Parental abductions is just an element of what we deal with when it comes to missing children. Um, this case in itself, the child had reached the age where she could decide where she wanted to live, which meant that all court documents in, in, involved in that case, they were now non void. You couldn't have a return order from the Hague Convention um, and the Hague Convention on International Child Abduction. That's the prime element for returning a child back home um, within a Hague, within a country that's actually signed up to the Hague Convention. So the child could decide where she wanted to live. I went back and I said, bang, this can't be done for these reasons. And um, it, I, I then witnessed the owner of the company have a meeting with the father of the child, which was the client, and took 30 grand off him and didn't tell that father that his case couldn't be completed for another few months. So that was my, that was my first introduction to how these companies started to line their own pockets. And then I started to realize that this was not about rescuing children. The way that the companies were run, and that's why the operators and 
the standards of the industry are so low. It wasn't about the actual heartfelt pulling a child out of a dangerous situation and bringing them home. It was about finances. So I left that company after witnessing that, and um, I started freelance. When I started freelance, I was, obviously, ideas are running through my head. I have to try to figure out how I can move forward with this, because this is definitely something that I'm passionate about. I take on a case, I consider it my own children, and that's what drives me to continue to keep going. I mean, I get myself to the point where I'm getting ill on a case because I'm pushing myself so many hours and I'm not looking after myself because I'm focusing on the case more than anything. So 2015, I came up with a concept of got to find a way to lower these costs, if not make it a free service. That's, that, that was the concept of what I wanted to create. So I started freelancing. And when I started freelancing, I started speaking to other companies that are actually out there. And there's not many of them at all. As I'm speaking to these companies and as cases start to come in from these companies, what I started to realize is that all of these companies are doing exactly the same thing as the first company that I was working for, except they're even worse because they're selling themselves as special forces. They're selling themselves as big time operators that have operated all over the world. As time went on and I learned their history, I got a hold of documents as my qualifications and experiences grew. Um, and I realized that they're not, these, these people are nothing like they say they are. They, they, they get to the point where if your children were kidnapped, you'd go to them, they'd tell you everything that you wanted to hear. They'd then charge you anywhere between 50 to 150 grand. Then they would buy their time. And the majority of the time, they don't even go on the cases. So as, as they're buying their time, they're obviously that money then being utilized for their own lives. Um, you get to the end of that period, and then all of a sudden they're either asking for more money or they're telling you that the case can't be completed because they have no more money. Uh, on a rare occasion, they complete a case um, and successfully. Um, if they successfully complete a case, it's usually overpriced. And um, then the other occasions when they've tried the cases, they end up, and you can Google all of this, they end up being arrested in multiple different countries all over the world. But there's no refund policy. So now these families have, have, have been left in financial ruins. And they haven't got their children back because they've just been ripped off. So they, they end up in the worst situation that they could possibly be in because somebody's actually taken advantage of their, their situation that they're in. Um, I, I, I've currently got a client and he's in a situation where he's been ripped off by two companies already. Um, and I'm the third person that he's coming to. So it becomes very difficult to operate in that sort of situation. It just must be awful. It's, I mean, it's terrible. To, to lose your child is the worst possible scenario I think you can face in your frigging life, man. Then to reach out for help and have all your, your life savings stolen, uh, uh, and it's not the money, is it? It's the fact that it's, it's cutting you off from your... It, it cuts you off from everything. It cuts you off from all of your other lifelines as well. Because you've got to remember, like, and when it comes to parental abduction, they rely on that money for the courts. Now, I'm not a big believer. I believe that everybody should go to the courts and get the right documents. But my experience tells me that the courts take a very long time. They take all of the money that could possibly be utilized. And the results are rarely in favor of the person that's actually going to court to try to get their child back. Which is why child recovery companies like that exist. And which is why they are able to take advantage of that. They'll take as much, if not more, than what the courts would anyway. And uh, it just destroys lives. That's all it does. And then you've got people then searching for the most easiest method, the, the, the most viable method to be able to get their children back, but they don't have the money for it anymore. Yes. And what, a, what an admirable thing to, to, to try and offer this service for free. Yeah. So when, when it comes to the free entities, um, my, my entire goal with the company is, is to technically turn it into what I would class as the people's company. Um, the current population of the planet is about 7.8 billion. Um, the UK in itself is only 69 million. If I can get 1 million people to donate two pound, then that would put us into a situation where we could take on four to six cases every single month. That's four to six children every single month bring, being brought home for the next two to three years. And that's just at that two pound per person. There's no financial pressure on the families. They also, they're under, in the understanding that they've actually got professionals going out there that are purposely looking for their child and physically on the ground chasing up leads rather than the authorities and nothing bad about the authorities in my eyes because there's a lot of police, for example, that want to do more but due to the 
um, jurisdictions that they're under the bureaucracy and the red tape. They can't go past waiting for a phone call that leads outside of their area of operations. This is why it's important that we're able to do this. So a million people donate two pounds. We will change numbers 100% without a doubt and be able to provide those cases for free. That's the entire end goal of what we want. That gives us two to three years to raise the same amount of money and that can continue for life. This is a company, of, as a veteran company, we can pass down through generation to generation of veterans that will be able to continuously do this. We get to the point where the police will actually come to us for their for our advice. Take When they have a child that goes missing, come to us to actually go and find that child, just like they do with a search and rescue and things like this. That's where I want to get to with the company. Um, and it's all about the, it's all about the money. No financial pressure on the family. Family is secure in knowing what's happening. They also get briefed just like we are in the military, just like we are in the contracting industry. We have a different level of standards, reports. They will always know what's going on and they will be involved in a case. Then you've got the, the actual side of the donators. So anyone that actually donates two pounds, they understand that it's it's only two pounds. I mean, I go to Starbucks on a regular basis, and I'll I'll spend eight pound in Starbucks just for two coffees, um, and two pound it, 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 in this day and age it, it's nothing. Have you got a Patreon? No, we haven't got a Patreon as of yet. Um, we're currently using um, the Just Giving app. Um, but the biggest problem that we're finding with it is that they take a percentage of donations um, and we're nowhere near raising the, the amount of donations that we need. Um, when it comes to, to costs of cases, an international case can be anywhere, anywhere between 15 to 25 to 30 grand per month. Mm. Um, and that's what we need to weigh up the options of. Obviously, we do everything that we can to cut those costs as low as possible. Having a kitty, which is designed for cases, that means that we can utilize every single penny that we need at a low cost, which means that 30 grand could actually take on two to three cases. And then we've got our local cases that we take on, which is like county lines, um, uh, kids that have gone missing on county lines. Then we've got online grooming where kids are, are convinced to run away from home to be with their groomers. And we've all experienced all of this over the last few months. Um, those cases, and they're anywhere between two and a half to four grand. So we're able to utilize every single penny that we have to. Now, if we've got guys permanently on staff, that all cuts down massive costs immediately. If we've got guys all over the world um, that are ready to and waiting for us to put them onto an operation that could costs down massively straight away, and we're able to utilize everything. And we're able to lower those costs immensely as we grow bigger. So it'd be really big. Yes. Just going back to the Patreon platform, I, I'd, yeah. I'd really take that seriously. Um, the reason being, it was suggested to me ages ago, because contrary to what people believe, and you, I'm sure you found this yourself, as an author, you kind of don't make any money, not not yeah. unless you're a Tom Clancy or, or a oh, J.K. Rowling or something, and even they, I don't think, probably make, by the time everyone's taking their cut, make as much as people think. Um so a friend of mine said, Chris, we, we set a Patreon. I said, what is it? He said, well, it's a platform. It's let's, let's just say it's a bit like Facebook, but for, profes for, for, for professionals. And if people like what you do, they will willingly sponsor you some money every month. So I thought, as we do, really? What? People yeah. have, you, you think, you know, give, give me. But here, here's the thing. I write books. They're all loosely based around um, mental health and, and, you know, supporting people in that area. And someone will read one of my books and they will get so much out of it that they, they want to give me some money. Oh, wow. Um, and so, <clears throat> and then, of course, when I start the YouTube channel and it kind of not, it, it got things a lot more in motion. But um Again, contrary to what people believe, I make no money on YouTube whatsoever. What, what little bit we do make all goes to my um, manager because he thoroughly deserves every single penny of it, I, I should add. Um, but what we do get is we, we've got a, a Patreon team and also I should include channel uh, members. Thank you, channel members. Um, but putting that to one side, the Patreon it's just a group of really lovely people that like what I do and they want to support me. And 
we offer a one ninety nine a month platform. I think it's a, a four ninety nine a month and a nine ninety nine a month. And at each of those levels, you get we give you a um, uh, we give you. Oh, I can't think. Of, uh, I think let's call it rewards. Um, and so at the one ninety nine a month, you're kept up to date with what we're doing. You know, there's motivational posts going out, photos of me. I don't know, <laughs> fishing or, or or whatever it might Having be. Money or running a marathon or, or, or whatever. Um, you can do group live chats via Zoom. Again, it's just a, quite a simple thing to set up and people can come and, you know, meet you personally. I know it's virt virtual, but it's still, I mean, if you are, said to me um, years back, I don't know, Chris, you could sit down in a chat with Stephen King. This is back when I was, writing really you know getting into writing i'd be yeah. like, can i and 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 this is kind of how it works um we're setting up a uh a talk for later this year so all the people that really get something out of your work can come and shake hands have a photo i'll do a speech we can go and grab a, a drink afterwards or whatever or, or do some um do some fizz the next day and it's uh, it, it's kind of a must for what you do. And obviously, you're probably already thinking of what you can offer people. But just to be just to have an insight into a case that went well, or what if the parents are willing, what the child's doing now. Um, meet it could be meet the team. You know, we're having a, a team Zoom. Next week, come and find out this is so-and-so with special forces. You know, this person's a, a professional medic, what, whatever it might be. But it's all stuff that's relatively um, sort of time, doesn't take a lot of time is what I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, I get I'm, I'm trying to say. But people will get a lot from. So that's, that's definitely um, because... I had one um, very generous person just come straight in with a thousand pounds. Wow. Um, had another one when they heard I needed microphones for the podcast, 700 pounds. And you wouldn't believe this ordinary, but companies have that much. Some companies have it to write off, so it's nothing to them. It just put it down for tax or whatever. Other people just have a lot more money than I do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can be an unhappy millionaire. And if you get someone like me saying, well, you don't have to be unhappy. You just got to tweak a couple of things in your life. Well, you can turn someone's life into paradise. Yeah. Absolutely. And if they've got, if money's not an issue for them, then so I'd seriously consider that. Um, and of course, it's the way the world's going, isn't it? With social media is people want to be included. People, if you've got a naff job or you're not, you're sitting down watching soap opera, you, you probably want to be more fulfilled than that. And when what you're doing, especially at the moment, because the, there's such a huge focus, whether it's accurate or not, but there is such a huge focus on, on um, the, child slavery issue um, yeah. you know tra trafficked children is the the correct term um the people rather than just putting stuff on facebook and sharing a youtube they can actually physically get involved so that that would be something um obviously for anybody listening if you'd want to get in touch with jay there'll be details below this youtube video um your website is pegasusops.com so pegasus uh what do you call that hot dash hyphen. hyphen hyphen dash or the small one ops.com yeah it's actually the first thing that comes up i think when you type pegasus into a search engine which is good good for you um so um yeah get in touch with Jay, folks, please, please do. Um, shall we talk? Um, 
You just I just want to run some things by you because I'm I'm a lifelong learner, Jay, and I like to listen to everything, research yeah. what I can. But I'm also obviously I'm 51 and I've seen a bit of the world, so I don't just buy into every conspiracy that's that's put. And also, I kind of know when someone slip slip in the public a Mickey, you know, whether it. it if something's put out in mainstream media, for example, it's just that to me, there's just that's someone else's agenda. Yeah, we've had them. But we are hearing a lot about this child trafficking. There's a film that's just coming out. Uh, oh my God, is it? Is it Out of the Shadows or something? Is that Tim Ballard's new movie? Yes, 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 that's yeah, that's yeah. right. And I put a, a video out not long back just explaining that that this isn't going to stop the issue of of child abuse in, in any form because it's systemic. It's it's if you have a, a capitalist system that rewards people for how much money they get in their bank, and you you're talking pe- people from unscrupulous backgrounds that don't care about children well what are they going to do they're going to traffic kids aren't they yeah. you you've met horrible people i should say most 99.99 percent people i've met around the planet have just been absolutely wonderful human beings but you do get like when you get mugged by the turkish mafia you're seeing some seriously psychopathic uh individuals who who they don't care about you. Yeah. They're certainly not going to care who they're trafficking in a, tra- in a transit van across the border or, or whatever. Um, so I just wondered if you can give us your take on, I mean, Donald Trump was supposed to be the, the, the saviour that was going to rescue all the children and people have messaged me saying, Chris, is it true the Navy SEALs are going in and rescuing <laughs> thousands of children at a time from underground um, they call them dumb dumbs, underground bunkers, and I have to sort of break it to them that that's not, you know, the military do what the government tell them to do, and the yeah. psychopaths tell the government what to do. So it's it's, I'd say it's an unrealistic. <laughs> it, it, it's a luck would be a wonderful scenario if indeed the problem is on the scale as people perceive. Um, but over to you, Jay. What do do, do, do you know anything? about this sort of area yeah um so i mean when it, when it comes to the scale itself of what has actually happened um i don't think people understand the actual concept of how big this scale is um all around the world every single year millions of children disappear um and that's not just including children it's including young girls um early 20s late teens um and it happens everywhere um just to throw a few statistics out there um america itself on average, about 850,000 children, and this is just children, are reported missing every single year. Out of that, there's about 30,000 which are taken from non-family entities, and there's a, uh, 30% that is taken from non-family entities. And then there's about 40% which are taken from family or known entities. Okay, That's just America, and that's nearly a million. Okay, um, UK, on average, is about 136,000 children, um, and out of that, there's about a third that are not, not actually found ever. Um, then you've got Obviously, that's the third that's not found. Jay, then, can you just repeat that? That that's incredible. Yeah, one hundred and thirty-six thousand children reported missing every single year. Now, with that with that number itself, you've got to understand that that's reports of a child maybe not coming home from school on time or coming yeah, back from yeah. friends on time. So these numbers are actually included in it, but it's around a third um of that that children are not found um and then you've got families just sitting there waiting no one knows they've gone to the police no one else does anything that's it police are just waiting for a phone call of any information from the general public then on top of that you've then got another i don't know probably about another twenty thousand which are parents abductions um known family entities um and obviously the the non-known entities of where they've disappeared that goes into sex trafficking that goes into um your um individuals that wish to do harm pedophiles things like this okay so so you've got multiple reasons kidnap and ransom is a rarity over in the uk you're probably going to get that south america or north africa um or the middle east but over here it's not so much so these are actually people that want to do harm when it comes to to the movie that's coming out with tim ballard or it's just came out tim ballard he's working in with the um the triple seven underground railroad system and all this sort of stuff 
it, it's a fantastic concept of what he's doing and what his team is doing is 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 a, is a great job without a doubt. I've got no 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 problems with what Tim Ballard does. There's a lot of companies I do have problems with, but not his. Um, but it's such a small scale. If he was to rescue, have you ever seen? the scientists talking about population growth using the jar and then filling the jar with ping pong balls and then filling the jar with marbles. And then he goes into the points of filling it with rice and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But you take one drop out and it makes no odds because it continues to grow. That's what's happening with sex trafficking. That's what's happening with all of these organized organizations that are around the world. And there are so many of them. The United Nations have started to recognize what's going on and they start, They tried to set up a program out in um, Kenya, which is to relocate, uh, to, to locate and then to recover children that have been kidnapped from Europe over to Africa and the same in reverse from Africa back to Europe. Um, they tried to take on this contract and give this contract out. Within the first week of this contract being taken on by another company, that company, it's a multi-million dollar contract, took that money and disappeared. Now they don't have a contract. But the point is, it's been recognised by the United Nations. Local councils are currently starting to recognise that something needs to be done about missing children, but they're only thinking about it and putting tests out there to see who is capable of actually locating missing children, primarily that children have gone from care homes, um, to actually recover them back. This is a new concept that's starting to spread and people are starting to think about it more. The budget will never be in it. If... The military, if the police, if the governments are not doing anything about rescuing our children, the entities that are, which will be the private entities like myself, like Tim Ballard, um, and then obviously genuine companies that are out there, we are so small because we don't have the funding to be able to do it that it's literally taking that grain of rice, which is going to be replaced by another million grains within about a few minutes. Um, Australia, every 18 minutes a child goes missing. That's Australia, and they've got a very low um, threshold of children going missing. So you can see what it's like around the world. And you take, you get one child back, there's millions more that have already got, or thousands more that have already gone missing within that minute. Yes, I talk a lot and until we address the, 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 the evil amongst us, which is the money system. It's, yeah, it's the central system of evil control on the planet. We've allowed certain individuals to get away with it for hun hundreds of years, certainly the last 400 years now of this, um, this hold that the central banking system has on the world, the perpetual slavery. It puts you in from, from birth, but um, I don't want to get too, I don't want to sort of suck it. It's not really sidetracking. It's, it's, I could definitely get into that and talk about that for a very well, long time. <laughs> you know, we need to wake up to the fact we're, we're the, there's a small group of individuals in society control the whole goddamn show, and they do yeah. it through they do it through the money system. So, in, if people care about children, we need to start putting the focus on the central evil, which is this. Uh, system of usury which is money lending um which was is outlawed in some cultures i think in the muslim yeah. culture it's illegal to lend money for for profit but um but uh going back to the all these children going missing it it to say it's alarming is an understatement when stuff starts to surface, um, I don't even know if I should say, I, I don't believe in saying names when no one's been found guilty, if that makes sense. But yeah. prominent politicians from the 70s who had, let's just say, yachts, yeah. where 11 children went out and only 10 came back. And um, there's even, let's just say, royal families been accused of this yeah. behaviour over there in Canada. Um, it it's fucking alarming, mate. You know, but it's that fine line between what is, you know, what is real and what what is just made up shit on the internet that just gets a bit of a snowball effect and seems yeah. and seems. Now they're digging up mass graves in Canada from these Roman uh, Catholic institutions, uh, orphanages of these um, 
indigenous children that were taken under the the the, 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 the alleged wings of these organizations and it it, it seemed it, it would appear to be uh, horrific child abuse on just fucking next level yeah. stuff is that what i mean and then uh, uh, sorry if i'm going on a bit but certain uh can we say hollywood celebrities i i got sent a video it, 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 I'm too scared to have it on my computer. It's fucking horrible. I'm yeah. not, it, hasn't, it hasn't got anything graphic in folks, nothing like that. But it's about a certain Hollywood celebrity who appeared to think he was getting away with, you know, talking in uh, symbols, can we say, and, and all this sort of stuff. And when you actually track some of these symbols he was putting out through his social media, it actually related to a, an underground website. And I think, you know, you know, folks know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, it, it, Jesus Christ, is it like there anybody just fucking normal left on the planet? No, there isn't. Ch children in itself, when when they're coming from broken families, when they're, when they're actually um, uh, put into care, for example, um, the, the, they're not classed as human beings anymore. It's 100% guaranteed without a doubt. You know as well as I know, whenever there's a rumour, there's always an element of truth to that rumour. People talk about conspiracies and talk about conspiracy theorists, and I hate using those words together in any way whatsoever. As tin hat wearers, they're all living on this different planet. They're all mentally insane. Um, and don't get, me, don't get me started on it too much because that's the road that we're going to be going down in the future. Um, and they, they fail to see how much research is done into it. They fail to see how much facts have been brought together and the dots have been added and it actually makes sense. Um, it happens. 100% it happens. You have to look, like you said, in the 70s. 70s and 80s, nobody knew where anything was going on. We didn't find out until the 2000s. When we found out what was going on in the 2000s, a lot of people got arrested for it. And yeah, um, a lot of people were already gone. But... Crimes and punishments, the minimal in comparison to what had actually happened. Would it surprise you and how evil that you know the world to be um, and you just got to look in Iraq and what Saddam and his family were like um, uh, as an individual and you look at these, let's say, higher tier, which they're not, um, the, the upper class of society and those small elements... Um, would it be a surprise if they thought that they were gods? Would it be a surprise that they thought they can get away with stuff that they've always got away with through generation to generation because this has been going on a long, long time? It, it, it doesn't in any way whatsoever. Always remember that there's an element of truth. Always remember that that rumour started somewhere and those facts, they eventually come out to prove what is true. And it, and it is, it's there. Yeah, we should also remember... Um, if this seems far fetched to people, remember that 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 the I'm just going to call it the abuse of children was legal or has been legal in many cultures over the years. Yeah. For example, the Spartans, who a lot of people you know use use their logo and all this sort of stuff as these fine upstanding warriors, well, they would take the the young boys under their wing, the young warriors, and and folks know what I'm getting. You know you. Use them as their plaything, and then of course, back through history, you had the, the people in positions of power. They had their slave boys or whatever. That um, so it's not it, it's not as though this stuff hasn't gone on. It just seems now that, that this stuff is still going on. You have to look at Afghanistan, modern day Thursday nights. It's renowned. It's been seen. We've witnessed it. It happens with the chai boys. It, it's a constant thing. Yeah, this is happening in modern day. In addition, I, I want to cover this at some point, but there's um, uh, so what's the face? I can't. Uh, Jelaine Maxwell, right? Apparently, was pushing at the, some big summit. I don't know, like a UN gathering or, or something for this. Um, for some 
change in maritime law um, where there was no longer law at sea. It, it, I'm, I'm, folks, I'm just paraphrasing my scrambled thoughts here because I hear so much stuff every day and, and, and I don't want to keep talking solely. But so basically um, trying to push for this uh, uh, lawlessness on the ocean. So it was... Um, uh, but at the same time, you've got these rich billionaires investing in submarines. And there's also allegedly underground bases and all and, and, and this kind of stuff. And this is where I, I, I just sorry for anyone listening who knows way more than this than me. I apologize if I'm not not doing the subject justice. But it, it just seemed to be that these elites were pushing for kind of area i.e offshore where there was no freaking law where they could have these these uh submarines and one of them came into um came into plymouth the other day it's very weird when you see them they're, they're like a yacht but they sit just below the surface you know you can just see a bit of the, the the superstructure just on top of the water and they're they're billionaire submarines now and this is a a, a growing thing and then of course when you think of epstein and what um what what he was up to then it it's like i say you just think bloody hell what is going on um and i mean if you send 135,000 people re children reported missing in the uk and i get it that some have just you know maybe gone to a friend's house and and they come back safely away but but a third don't yeah that is seriously covered up, isn't it? If your average British person knew that 30,000 kids are going missing every year. You're, you're there to see it. I'm not joking. Every single day I get tagged in something. Uh, someone's gone missing, usually a child, um, sometimes um, a veteran. But majority of the time, child. Every day I'm getting tagged into these situations. We can't take on the cases because we don't have the money. The parents and the families don't have the money. And it breaks my heart every single time that I get one of these and I have to sit back and just leave it. Um, we do take on, obviously, as many as that we can. But then you go on to, if you go on to the um, Interpol website and you look at Amber notices for missing children, and the list is endless. Amber notices for missing children. I can guarantee you, you're going to be shocked by how many you see. And it's broken down into countries. You just look at the different countries and you'll be able to see how many people. Don't forget, that's only a small percentage of children that get onto those notices. That's not every child. It's such a small percentage that get onto there. But they keep popping up every day. Gosh. No one's looking for them. That's what, that's what the world doesn't understand. I've brought it up so many times. I use social media massively as much as possible. I've never been really successful on Facebook. Instagram is starting to grow, and Instagram's only primarily growing due to the fact I use TikTok, and TikTok has been my most successful application that I can use for social media because I can actually reach out and speak to the people about it. Um, it's, it's everywhere, I'm telling you. It's, it's just crazy. Yes. and it People are on there all the time sending me stuff. <laughs> And the way I see it is our political infrastructure is made up of a lot of people that have come up through, I'm just giving one example here, but the, the public school system or, or for American friends, if you say it, call it something different, basic private schooling, yeah. boarding school where a lot of boys get together at a young age, you know, the age where you possibly should be out discovering girls or whatever it is. So your first sexual experience is likely from an older lad when you're quite young and of course this has an, a massive effect on people's um psyche and then they come up through power and of course they're then honed in on as being blackmailable because if you carry the you know this thing into your adulthood and, and clearly a, a lot of these mps do um, or if if what I've read is anything to be believed, you you can see that we've got this dark, twisted infrastructure of blackmailable MPs. Apparently, was is it called the the Ho de la Garon? The um, it was the children's home on one of one of the British islands. 
was it Jer- Jer- Jersey? Apologies if I've got this wrong, folks. Um, but but where allegedly they found child remains. Um, well, I heard back along that MI6. It went on so long that MI6 had cameras in these in in these rooms where the privilege. I, I, I call them elite just for people know what. Obviously, they're not the the de- depraved elite. Yeah, but they were being going over there on their yachts, abusing these kids, and and MI6 were getting it all on camera to then use, uh, you know, to supply the shadow government with their their um, blackmail information. And again, I've mentioned this a lot, but you know, certain prime minister allegedly uh, arrested twice, I believe it was for for exposing himself in public toilets um got away of it by giving the police his middle name yeah and if i was to say kind of then shepherded the country quite with quite a lot of force into 20 years of of vicious conflict abroad you you can see how these things and and that's covered i mean what i'm saying i bet there's people listening oh chris what are you talking about well, work work it out, folks. <laughs> you know, because I've had to. There's just so much though that's involved. It's difficult to get it all together. It is all involved. I mean, you have to look at what's going on with the Georgia Guidestones and what's happening in modern times. You have to look at um, what is classed as the New World Order. Um, that there is so much that you can connect to each other, and you can see it happening all around you if you just open your eyes to it. A hundred percent. It is, and it is. It's it's happening all around you. But people quite often are blinded by um, the actual lies that they see because they're seeing those lies as the truth. The government has got to the point and and these entities, because it's not the government as such, um, are, are pushing conditioning motions out towards people. Um, and it can be a blatant lie, which is obvious straight away, bang, that is a lie, you're lying to me. But it's classed as the truth because it's seen in the normal forms of what people see all of the information that they receive. And that's how they, that's how they educate themselves in life. It's, it's an unfortunate situation when you get somebody screaming um, at somebody else for having a different opinion and then getting to the point where they're raging and they're, they're, they're wanting to push towards violence because of a different opinion, instead of having a debate and then talking to that person about and edu- educating yourself on their opinion in comparison to your opinion, when you've lost that art, Society's in a bad place. Yeah. Society's in a bad place anyway, because I consider myself an enlightened person, Jay, right? So I try not to operate out my ego, although we all we all have an ego, let's face it. Yeah. Um, I try to eat as best I can. I have my, my weaknesses and, and I recognise them and I try and work on them every, every day. Sometimes I'm, some days it, go swimmingly other days i take a step step backwards um i love all people simply because i think we're all a product of, we're all the universe essentially we're people we've been kidded to believe we're identity second because yeah. it makes it so easy for the ruling uh, again i use the term the rule let's call them the ruling psychopaths it makes yeah. it so easy to control us if i think i'm chris and i'm cool and you're Jay, and you're doing some good. It's all all division. But to get to this position of life, I've, I've had to work really hard, mate. You know, I've had to learn. I've had to look myself in a mirror. I've, yeah. I, I've, I, I, I have to genuinely develop love and empathy for all other human beings on this planet. Um, I've had to get over my vices or as <laughs> best I can. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. None of our MPs have ever done any of that shit. No. They're fat, greedy. Sorry, I shouldn't use the word fat, but I, I use it as in fat cats. They, they're greedy. Um, they're slovenly. They, they dine out on liquid lunches that they, they, that they expect us to pay for. They cheat two houses or what, whatever it is. They, they, look at the Prime Minister. He's a hideous state of health. There's absolutely no way that man can be in the kund, what, what what I refer to as the Kundalini state, which is, um, and I'm not not slagging them off here, folks. I'm I'm using this as an example that we pick the most 
we pick depraved people to lead us and we fall for it every time there's a general election we go back like, yeah. like sheep and just vote again for these people that have got very dodgy pasts um not not all of them of course but we I hate to sound negative, Jay, but we're kind of on a bit of a hiding to bloody nothing. So long as we keep heading forward and not facing up to the yeah. fact that we don't, we haven't got enlightened individuals leading the world forward. Instead, we've got stupid psychopaths who control us with idiotic notions of going into bloody space to take, you know, to, so they can get more dollars in their, uh, their, their bank accounts. Um, it doesn't matter who, who's elected in. It's always the same agenda, no matter what. I, I, it doesn't lie at the government. It lies above the government. Do you remember when you were a kid, you always believed that the prime minister or president of a country would be like the most cleverest person on the planet? You were like, oh, that's someone that I want to be. I want to be the president. I want to be the prime minister, whatever. And then you grow up and then you realise the state that we're actually in with the people that we've got in power. It's it's the most scariest thing on the entire planet to even look at. It really is. But when you start to realise that it doesn't matter because they need somebody in that mentality to actually go along with the agenda of what is actually really happening, that's when you start to realise it's way bigger than that. And there's dark entities involved in every single thing. Without a doubt there is. I mean, why... Why did we go to war? This is this is one question that I've asked a million times on my TikTok channel. Why did we go to war? Why did we go to Iraq? Why did we go to Afghanistan? And I've heard the regurgitated BS that's been pushed out there continuously over and over and over again. But it's it, it's not those reasons in any way whatsoever. I spent a lot of time in those countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, and I can see what I believe it to be and why, why we went there, which is a bigger agenda of what actually exists and it also comes into play with um, 9-11. But the agenda of what they're pushing out, as in the regurgitated BS, it's it's nowhere near them. It's, yeah. not about, it's not about oil. It's not about gas. It's not about the Americans. The Americans don't have the oil fields in Iraq. It's the Russians and the Chinese that have them now. So, um, well, it's about this Belt and Road Initiative, is it not? This this super highway between the, the East and, and, and the West uh, hence why I think we're seeing a lot of action now in East Africa, which is, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's to secure the Suez Canal. Um, and it's it's a manifestation of George Orwell's 1984. It's yeah. having, having these super states played off against each other when they're, in reality they're all controlled by this, um, you know, this... this Twisted minority, yeah, who, who only care about power um, and haven't haven't got in touch with their, their spiritual selves, or if they did, they've rejected it. Um, the thing is, not everybody is supposed to wake up to it, and that, 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 that's the problematic thing: is that not everybody is. Some people are too far gone. Some people choose not to. Some people choose to stay in the levels that they're at because they're happy with it. So it, it, it's a constant battle if, you, if you're if you ever going to try to wake anybody up. And I've seen people try it time and time and they get so frustrated with it because they're not listened to and then they're the ones that are looked down upon. I, I've experienced it in real life. When I was in Kajaki, for example, in 2016, I was the most experienced operator that's down there. The rest of the guys were quite new to the industry. Um, no one had served more than six years in the industry apart from one other who I'd known for a long time anyway. And it was the guys that were new to the industry that were actually looking at me when I'm talking to them because I've seen the changes within the industry from the security industry to the risk management industry and all this sort of stuff and the laws and the rules and why we do things and why we don't do things. And then obviously the International Code of Conduct. And they're looking at me as if I'm the one that's trying to cause problems by saying, you can't do that because it's literally against everything that we're supposed to be, be, be doing. <laughs> um, and it, it comes against. Now, this is in a real life situation of me being more experienced than them and them making me look like I'm the idiot. That's literally what's happening when it comes to people bringing out the truth of what's actually happening and then being shunned for actually bringing out that truth. Um, and it will, it will be a continuous thing uh, for a period of time anyway until uh, until it comes to head which I believe might be coming very soon yes I just want to chuck out some positive um, answers to the questions people might be thinking right now Jay and, and that is you know what it, it, you can feel quite helpless but yeah, I, I believe 
at the very epicenter of all this is the spiritual battle within ourselves. I, I, I think a lot of people are so outraged about the child trafficking stuff and they're on the net every day about da da da. But I think a lot of that comes from the unhappiness they're sensing in their own lives. And it, and it just gives a, a, an avenue for projecting these feelings of, of unhappiness and help, helplessness. I'd say work on yourself, folks. Learn, ultimate love for yourself is number one ultimate acceptance that you're a beautiful product of this this universe you don't need let's say procedures you are born perfect yeah you don't need um to go and vote for corrupt leaders that literally hate you they despise you they right so I, I, i'd say turn off main if you love yourself and you love your family turn off mainstream media it's toxic poison yeah Anything you see on your screen is only there for a reason. It's to keep you living in uneducated left brain fear so that you're just obedient mind slaves. Um, be nice. Say hello to people. Ch change your diet. Try to get the alkaline diet so you don't get sick. If you, if you never get sick like I don't, then you're not really going to be in fear at the moment, are, are, are you? I'm, I'm not saying it works for everybody, although I, I have my own view on that. I'm not a, a medical practitioner, so I can't say. Um, but there's an awful lot you can do closer to home um, if you want to change the situation for, for all children um, for the better. If you've been affected by anything that Jay and I have said today, uh, again, remember, you are loved unconditionally by the universe, by guys like us. Certainly all, all my team, we, we, uh, we feel the same. Sometimes it's bad experiences like they're put on, put on us by adults. Just remember, it's not personal against you. These were people that uh, haven't had the privilege of, of being well people in their lives and it helps to see it for what it is, but it's important to reach out, seek help. Don't struggle on your own. If you're hitting the bottle, the drugs, whatever it is, uh, you know, many of us have been there. It is, it's not just that there's light at the end of the tunnel. It's that when you step out there, it's fucking brilliant. And you will be uh, uh, not just 10 times a happier person than you are now, but you'll be 10 times better in society because you, 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 you will know empathy. You'll know that yeah. other, you know, life isn't always easy um, for everybody. Jay, I'm going to wrap there because I want as many people to watch this as possible and I don't yeah. want it to go on, on, on too long. So we'll put your details below. Um, your book, uh, Angel in the Shadows. Angel in the Shadows. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Folks, get involved. Go and grab a copy of that and leave a nice review if you can on, on the platforms like, like Amazon. Um, let's chat again, mate, can we? Because this is fascinating. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And it's also, I have to say, it's nice to meet awake veterans. Yeah. And I get that pleasure quite a lot now. Um, I think we have a unique, we have a unique skill set and we're going to hunt you down and bloody use it <laughs> that's what the fun did to me on their first news article <laughs> it compared me to the real life taken uh that's what also i get now seriously but we do have you know we do have a, a skills and i'm not just talking yeah. physical i'm talking mental and we can be a force um for extreme good but you kind of got to ditch the following the mainstream yeah, absolutely yeah you know, uh, uh, and you know you're not in the military now. It's about the future of the, the planet and doing doing the right thing. So, Jay, I'm going to love you and leave you, brother. Massive thank you for what you're doing. Is it? Was there anything you we need to add that I might have overlooked? No, I think uh, I think we've got pretty much everything. Um, all I all I can say really is thanks for having me on. Thanks for for letting me get my story out there. Ah, oh, we'll come back come back on whenever whenever you you know whenever it can help you. Oh, definitely. And certainly come and give us some updates. And, yeah, we'll uh, Massive thanks. No, I appreciate it, man. Friends at home, big love to you all, you legends. 
if you could like and subscribe and just share this video and then you know you, you are helping to save children too thank you